not here yet. And um, let me let me get started with uh, the uh, lesson for today. Um, and I'll just get right into it. I think I've started my recording and I will jump in to start doing my screen recording here. OK, it looks like it's on. OK, we're still going through le lesson six and I'll finish le lesson six today. Uh, before, however, I uh, jump into lesson six, let me point out to you that I have put the uh, sample final exam on the Moodle. And uh, so you'll have it for the rest of this week and then all of next week to look at. Uh, then the week after that, I will post the actual final exam. And you'll have to get it done before the end of that week. And I haven't decided exactly what day, but please, 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 please try to be on time because I don't have arbitrarily long length of time in order to grade the final and uh, and put the grades on. Um, and um, as I've told you before, I, I think that uh, uh, I think just about everyone in the class, I'm trying to think of anyone's not, I think just about everyone in the class, I think, is doing extremely well. The only issue that I have is uh, with some people, I'm not 100% sure who's actually in the class uh, because unlike every other university I've ever been associated with, the registrar um, doesn't collect the names of the students who are supposed to be in the class. You know, at every other university, students go to the registrar, say, I want to be in this class. The registrar looks to see if the number of students who are supposed to be in the class has been exceeded yet. And then they will officially register students to be in the class. That doesn't happen here. You don't register class with the registrar. So people have to tell me that they're going to be in a class, and then I put their names on my Excel spreadsheet. And um, OK, that's great. Now, what happens is I've had some people tell me they want to be in the class, and then they haven't shown up for anything, and they haven't turned in any assignments. Um, so I'm assuming that they're not in the class, we'll see. And um, then there are some people who have, not many, but a few people who have been hit and miss as far as actually doing the weekly assignments. So I'm not 100% sure what their status is. Not many, but, um, uh, but most people have, uh, you know that maybe they've missed a week or two of assignments, but they've gone back and uh, tried to submit them late, um, and uh, and I've accepted that and registered them. So, and also I have, uh, if I take all the people that have told me that they want to be in the class, I actually have more than 30 students in the class. It's not like it's one cohort; it's one and a half cohort. So of students. So it's not like one cohort is supposed to be in the class and that's it. It's uh, so it's kind of confused here and uh, I'm not getting um, terribly upset by it yet um, because of this whole situation with the online classes and people now some people are on campus, some people are off campus. It's really a mess with this COVID. And um, so in any case, the actual final, the practice final is for the rest of this week and next week. It's on the Moodle. I will then, and it's going to be very similar to the actual final, then I'll give you the actual final to do the week before finals week. Then you turn it in. That way, when you have to do the other finals, you don't have this practice final sort of 
sitting in the background there as something you need to finish while you're studying for your other finals. OK, I hope that helps. Now let me get into this here. And um, uh, I'm in uh, doing this uh, lesson, what I call lesson six, which I'm in the middle of here to finish it up here for this week. And we're, we're doing uh, loops and we've done while loops and we and we're going to be doing for loops and um, this is a particular lesson on infinite loops and infinite loops are usually a mistake and infinite loops are usually in the form of while loops because while loops don't need to terminate in other words you can have a termination condition which is never met in a while loop and that's for example um, what's happening here and usually those things are a mistake when you do that. OK, so here's another sketch that does infinite loops as a while loop. We set some variables as integer variables here. And we're drawing a bunch of vertical lines here. Just let me run this so you can see. See, we have a bunch of vertical lines. Notice that the spacing between the vertical lines depends on the position of the mouse. So the spacing spreads out and then uh, tightens back up there. OK, so we're having a couple of new things here in this example. Let me close this. OK, so we set up uh, some integer variables. We have a void set up, which sets up the graphics box. Uh, void draw, black background, the stroke is white as we see right here, um, setting x equal to zero. So whatever we're going to use x for. Now, what I want you to see here, this is a new uh, command. Here, let me apologize here. Let me kind of blow my nose. That's the constrain command here, sort of in the middle of the page. And uh, uh, spacing, constrain, mouse X. OK, you, know, you can you can Google constrain, look it up, see what it does. It uh, constrains okay, the position of um, of the mouse. And we're looking um, mouse X divided by two, four and width. OK, what does constrain do? Like I said, if you're not sure what these things do, you Google them. Constrain. Uh, constrains a value to not exceed a maximum and minimum value. So we're constraining um, something based on mouse X. OK, so here, for example, they give an example. Uh, constrain amount low and high. So integer or float. This could be an integer or float. Um, it has a maximum, uh, it has a minimum limit of low, and that if it gets lower than low, it gets set back to the low value, and if it's higher than high, it gets set back to the high value. So uh, the values of mouse or the amount here will always be between low and high, or including low and high. So that's uh, that's what constrain does. So. Now we'll come back. Here we go right here. OK, so we're going to constrain. Um, mouse X divided by two. We can take those spaces out if we want it. Should still run without a problem, does. Uh, to, so it's going to have to be greater than four and less than width. So less than the width of the width, which is defined up here as 480. Uh, this line is commented out so that the sketch does not crash. If you put it back in, this sketch will crash. Spacing equals mouse X divided by two. OK, wow. We can comment, we can uncomment and see. Okay. Exit condition. 
If X is greater than N legs, wow. X is, now here's our loop. While X is less than N legs, we execute this block of code from here to here. We draw a line uh, and then we increment X by spacing. So this is a loop. Remember, while is a loop. This goes around and around and around. Uh, and then um, it, until we, until this condition is not satisfied. So while X is less than or equal to N legs, and then we are increasing the value of X by spacing here. So um, potentially this thing can go on forever because um, uh, depending on what happens here. Okay, if, if we, this is designed so that X never exceeds N legs, this loop would go on forever. Okay, but here, uh, I don't think we have a problem immediately, but let's take this out and see. And now see what happens. Okay, here's our code. It's not drawing anything. Spacing equals mouse X divided by two. So what's going on with that? Um, well, here we're saying this that um, here we're saying the spacing is we're constraining mouse X divided by two be, be between four and width. And uh, so let's try running this again and see what happens. Okay, look at that. I commented out. I'm trying to remember what I was doing when I wrote this. Here I commented out and it works. Now, so what this is doing is setting the value of spacing right here to be mouse X divided by two. So if, if mouse X is zero, it's less than four, okay? So we're trying to set the value of spacing while at the same time, we're constraining the value of spacing. So here we're setting the value of spacing so that Initially, spacing violates the constraint. Now, let's see, let's set the value of spacing to be, um, let's just set it to be five and see what happens. There, now I'll run. Now look at that. It runs. Let's put it as 10 and see what happens. Why? Because, well, let's make it higher. Let's make it 50. There, 50. So this value is within constraint, the constrained value. So now the this spacing has increased. So this works fine, provided the value spacing is within the constrained value. But if I set spacing to be three, no, yeah, three. Three is outside this range. And while it's running, so it's constrained, now um, but it's smaller, so now let's try spacing equals mouse X. Like that. This is the X position of the mouse. And it's not working.
let me comment this out. Okay. Um, let me try, I want to, you know, so what I'm doing here is I'm doing experiments. So, uh, so, so you can try to understand what's happening here because um, I wrote this out. I knew I had something in mind and, uh, and I tell people I'm, I'm old and easily confused. So I'm trying to figure out what I was trying to do here. Um, let's see, spacing equals mouse X. Um, let me try mouse X plus four. So this is the problem here, setting it equal to this variable. Now it works. Okay, so I think that this is, these are a few clues here as to what's going on. So mouse X plus four, we're okay. And, but remember initially when we run this, um, the mouse X isn't even in the window. So let's say, now what happens if I do this to three, mouse X plus three? Okay. And let's go all the way down to one. Okay. And zero. And so here is where it fails. Right in here. So let's try point one. Okay, it doesn't like it. Why? Because spacing. Yeah, it was in teacher. Yeah. In the right. beginning. It said right. Because it's set right. That's why it doesn't like point one. So this is something for you to play around with a little bit. And uh, okay, now. Uh, so this is an example of uh, another loop. Uh, using uh, this constrain uh, command here. And um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else in this short little code, and I don't think so. Okay. Don't save. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, another infinite loop right here. Okay, now notice I say another infinite loop, don't do this. Let's try to run Okay, so far that looks okay here. Um, integer y equals 80, x spacing is 10, integer length is 20, integer n legs is 480. We have our setup. We got a void draw background stroke. Spacing constrain mouse X between for and with. Okay, we have this. Wait a minute, this is the same code. Okay, okay, sorry about that. I guess I wasn't paying attention here. Yeah, I was a bit confused, like why it's same. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, here we go. Okay, here, let's run this, see what happens. Here we're drawing these vertical lines here. Again, here we have our variables. Um, we set up, notice we have set size and background out, outside of void setup. This is a for loop. We set up our variables here, integers. OK, so before we we're using a while loop, here we're using a for loop. Let me explain 
how for loop works. Uh, with for loop, uh, we have four, and the key variable in the for loop is going to be the variable x. And we haven't defined x to be anything yet up here. We've, we, we said y, spacing, and len, but we haven't said x. So you can actually set the value of x inside the for loop. Okay, we could have set it out here and then not set it in here. Okay, but for integer x equal 50. If x is less than or equal to 150, if this is true, if x is less than or equal to 150, we what we do is every time through the loop, we take x and we increase it by the value of spacing. So this is the, okay, and then if this if this situation is true, and we execute this block of code that goes from here to here, so here I have four integer x equals fifty. Uh, x is the variable we're changing. If x is less than or equal to one fifty, then we change the value of x. We increase it by the amount of spacing. Now, we could, now here, let me let me just go in and Google for in processing, okay? So for in processing there. For, now, Notice in all these here, we're setting integer i equals zero. Usually in loops, by the way, and this, this is a custom that goes back to the beginning of programming um, and uh, it probably even has its roots in writing down mathematical expressions. But um, we frequently, use the variables i and j and k as integers. So I know my own personal habit is I use i, j, and k to be the loop variables. So for integer i equals zero, phi is less than 40, we execute, and then next time through the loop, we increase the value of i by plus one. So that's what we're doing right here. Here we're increasing the value of i by five and so on. Okay. Now, um, I was telling you, you can define this to be outside the loop. And uh, I might be confusing this with another language. Uh, well, let's give it a try. Let's go in here and let's do integer x like this. Now, if I just run this, the, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, integer x. This should give me an error because it shouldn't like that I'm um, specifying the type of variable x is in two different places. And it does, duplicate local variable x. Now, um, let's take out integer here. So this is what I'm, I'm thinking, as long as we don't specify it to be an integer, should be okay, but like I said, maybe I'm confusing languages. Now I run, and indeed it runs okay. So I, here I set x to be an integer, and then here I set a minimum value for x. So this is the minimum value, and then as long, and every time I go through the loop, I increase x by spacing, okay? And, um, as long as x is less than or equal to 150, I continue going through the loop. So you see here, by the way this is set up, for loops don't are not typically infinite loops. Um, now, yep, I mean, potentially, I could make it an infinite loop uh, by saying if x is greater than 50 uh, or greater than or equal to 50, we do this. So we could change, make that change. Let's say 
greater than or equal to 50. And now if x starts off at 50, we increase the value of x every time through the loop. So this thing will probably, if it doesn't give me an error, it will go on forever. Well, it's not drawing anything here. Um, and it's because uh, y. I'd have to think about that for a minute. But executing this, the line goes from x, y, uh, so it goes from 50y to 50y plus length, and um, length is 20. So I'm not sure why it's not drawing anything here. I'd have to play with that a little bit. I could change this to 10. And I'm still getting nothing, okay? So yeah, I'd have to play with this a little bit here to see what's going on with that. But this loop never ends. Um, and um, so, uh, so it's possible I have a for loop which never ends um, if this condition in here is never violated. But usually, usually for loops are not infinite loops. It's the while loops which tend to be infinite loops. So, let me make this less than or equal to see what happens here. So we get these lines back. Notice the lines stop here and don't continue because this must be the point where the if condition is violated, right? Because notice we have spacing is 10. Okay, so um, it doesn't take many times through the loop before the value of X uh, exceeds our condition. So here's a for loop. Uh, for loops and while loops are used all the time when you're writing code um, and doing things. So like I said, here's another one. Oh, let me stop this. Cancel. Um, so for loop. Um, Usually people define the, uh, the restrict the loop variable. And so you don't want to use the loop variable outside of the loop. And this, if you do this, this will restrict it. So this is why typically we define the variable inside the loop. There's then the only place here where the loop, where the variable uh, works is inside this block of code if we do that, which is why people tend to define the loop variable inside the loop there. I think that's usually, that's a generally a good practice. The for loop was in week 11's homework also. Um, yes, okay. Uh, yeah, I've, uh, the what I'm doing in class is not 100% lined up with, uh, the uh, the videos that I pre-recorded um, now, but roughly they're kind of lined up, okay? Not but not perfectly because as I go through classes, um, you know I'm not sure everything I'm going to cover in every class. So, and and I've done things a little bit differently. I hope that doesn't create confusion. And um, so, but roughly they're lined up. OK, now um, got one more. And uh, here, let me do. I'm going to go get a cup of coffee if you don't mind here. OK, so here's another local variables. I'm going to go get a cup of coffee now 
uh, please excuse me just just for a moment, okay? And uh, and I'll be back. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm back. And 
Yeah, I was uh, I was up later than usual last night because there was a faculty meeting for the faculty at the Naren campus. The meeting started at nine o'clock Naren time, uh, which for me was ten o'clock at night, and then it passed. It was it went on past eleven o'clock at night, and um, I get up at five a.m. for this class because class starts at six and uh, as I always tell you um, I'm old and so I get up and you know fix myself something to eat and I have my first cup of coffee and uh, usually takes me half hour 45 minutes to do that and then I you know look at the news and and so on and uh, so today is a uh, um, holiday in the United States. It's called Thanksgiving Day, and um, um, the it's the day, uh, big family gathering day, where people get together with friends and family, and they have big meals, and you know you can have ten or more people at a big family meal, and um, you get together with. Uh, you know, your, your aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters and grandparents and so on. And uh, today, most people aren't doing that because of the virus. In fact, the uh, Center for Disease Control is telling people uh, not to do it. Uh, but some people are still doing it. And so they expect a big spike in infections because of people having large family gatherings. And um, so, yeah, as uh, as winter has, uh, has started here, weather's getting colder and colder, and people are forced indoors. And when people are forced indoors, they're in close proximity, which facilitates the spread of the virus. Um, I think most recently, at least here in the West, we have now had three um, um, uh, biomedical companies have announced that they have viruses, uh, they have vaccines that have passed the their testing to this point, and they're trying to get approval. And they, even before they knew that the vaccines w have worked properly. As soon as they started, they had they thought they had a vaccine, they started testing it. They started mass producing the vaccine in the hopes that it would test out okay. And then if it tests out okay, they already have uh, you know millions and millions and millions of, of doses of the vaccine to give out. So there have now been three companies that have seem to have successful vaccines that appear to be over 90% effective, which is phenomenal. Usually vaccines aren't 90% effective. And they hope actually before the end of the year to start distributing the, these vaccines. And um, so they have, um, you know, vaccines that are being distributed around the United States, vaccines that are being shipped to other countries for at least one of the vaccines, the uh, it has to be kept at extremely cold temperatures, uh, which can cause a problem if they're trying to distribute it to places that don't have the ability to keep things this cold. By extremely cold, I'm talking about um, maybe um, um, 50 degrees below zero cold. Um, and uh, so they need special facilities to keep the vaccines cold. That could, that's one of them that has to be really, really cold like that. Not the other ones, I'm not sure what the restrictions are. So uh, it can cause some problems, at least with that one vaccine and getting it distributed widely. But, you know, they're, uh, they're, all these companies are generating millions and millions of doses, 
if the companies are from the United States, some of these vaccines will be distributed in the United States and some of them will be sent abroad to be distributed. And um, so hopefully by the summer, uh, there'll be uh, a sufficient immunity so that life can go back to normal. I'm hoping that'll be true. We'll see about that. And uh, so this, uh, this whole virus has thrown uh, uh, um, a, a wrench in the works, as they say. Um, and uh, wow, it's really been something. Okay, so local variables. Now, the idea with local variables is actually an important idea in programming. And it's when we define a variable, variables can be defined so that they are well defined throughout the entire program, or they can be only defined in a set block of code. Now, local variables are usually what they mean by that is they're only defined within a set block of code. So if you try to use the variable outside that block of code, you'll get an error. OK, now this is, uh, you might want to look at this a little bit more. And, and you know, if you're really going to be start doing some programming and processing, you will probably have to look at this a little bit more. Um, and um, so local variables. So typically in processing, if we define a variable out here, before we get, when we define variables before void setup, those will be global variables that will be defined in every block of code. So they'll be defined in void draw, they'll be defined in mouse pressed, they'll be defined everywhere throughout the entire piece of code. However, if we only define a variable within a block, then that variable doesn't mean anything outside the block. So for example, here we're defining integer x equals zero. So we're defining x inside void draw. So x only works inside void draw. We try to use x outside void draw and it won't work. So if we used x up here, it wouldn't work because we're only defining it inside void draw. So, I mean, I could, let's try to give you an example here. If I say x equals zero, well, let me do, or let me define integer. I can define integer x equals zero, and this should work because x is not defined in void setup yet until I do this. So I run unexpected, doesn't like. Uh, you, yeah, so my column. Yeah, it. yeah, I forgot that. Of course, I've never made that mistake. Okay, integer x equals zero there, semi, not col yeah, semicolon, okay. There. So I can define it here, and this X only works inside this block, and then I define it again down here, and this X only works inside this block. So I'm using the same name, but it's actually a completely different variable. Odd, an odd thing to say, right? Um, now, if I don't do this, I'll get an error that variable x does not exist, so I'm already getting an error. X cannot be resolved to a variable. Now, I could define x up here, integer x, put a semicolon, and here I could put, and now I, I have to comment it out here. Let's try this. 
it run well it's running but i don't know if it's doing anything integer x is not defined here but it is available here in other words i can use x inside void draw because i've defined x to be up here so i could set x to be zero up here now let's try so I still don't write it um, now. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So let me take this out. Let me take out the comment. Let me run the code just see what's going on. OK, so. There we go right there. OK, let's look at this here. OK, I've got integer X equals zero. So X is only defined inside this block of code, not outside the block of code, so only between this and this statement, will X work? So X is available. Since X is declared within draw block of code, let me extend this. It's available here. Notice, however, that it's not available. Um, I think <clears throat> this should be outside draw, not inside draw. Oh, it's not available inside draw above where it is declared. So up here, if we try to do something with X, it won't work. So let me show you that. I try here to say X equals zero. I'll get an error. Variable X does not exist. I already got an error, right? There. So comment this. Now, notice, however, that okay, we're above where it is declared. Also, it is available inside the while block of code <clears throat> because while is inside of draw. So inside of draw here, I define X. The while block of code is inside draw, so X is defined in here. OK, so this idea can sometimes cause you problems um, where you're assuming that a variable is defined in a block, but it turns out not to be. So you have to be a little bit careful about this <clears throat> or you, you can get errors or you may not get an error, but things may not run right if you're assuming the value of X is something other than it's supposed to be. But Notice I have while X is less than width, and then I execute this. And um, so um, X equals zero, integer X equals zero, and um, then I use it inside while. Now, what happens is when I get down to mouse pressed, mouse pressed is outside the draw block of code. So X is not defined in here, OK? So if I tried to use X in mouse pressed, I would get an error. And uh, let me show you that. Oh, notice this, by the way. I don't know if you've noticed this, but after a semicolon, I can actually put another, another uh, statement on the same line. So I can say X equals 0. And then semicolon. So I have on one line, I have two program statements. Uh, I don't necessarily recommend you do this because that also could get confusing. I think it's it's easier for um, everyone if you put every program statement on its own line. But um, now if I try to run this, it says, well, it says variable X does not exist. Why? because variable of X was defined inside that block of code and not inside this block of code. So there. Now, um, <clears throat> OK. Oop, I don't want to, didn't want to do that. There. <clears throat> now, I can make X work everywhere if I, to find it up here right in the beginning of the program. 
integer x, if I define it to be some value up here, it'll work inside void setup, work inside void draw, it'll work inside mouse pressed. Okay, so. Uh, yeah. So defining uh, variables inside blocks of code. Now, what you can do is you can use the two, the same variable name <clears throat> to mean two completely different things. Is you can use the same variable name, but for example, inside void draw, where this X would only work inside void draw, and then you could define X again in mouse pressed, and it's a different X. You could make it float up here and an integer down here. OK. So much uh, for things that are going to cause you problems. I promise this will give you errors down the down the road. Oh, what was I was I doing? Seven there, eight. OK, we're still drawing lines. Let's just run it and see. And so here it's drawing lines down like this. <clears throat> now, notice that integer y is set outside at the very beginning of the program. It's outside all, all of the blocks of code. So y works everywhere in the program. <clears throat> but I'm not using it <clears throat> inside void setup. Set the background to be what right. I set the frame rate. Remember what frame rate does? It determines how many times a second void draw executes. So frame rate is five. So five times a second. And get in void draw. Now why is defined? Now, set my stroke to be black. I draw a line from zero to Y. I, and um, from, I'm sorry, from zero, the coordinate zero Y to width Y. So I'm drawing it across like that. Then I increment Y, Y plus equals. Now remember, void draw is already a loop. So I don't have to write a separate for loop or while loop because it begins y is set to be zero. It draws the first line. Then I increase y to 10. And I increase y to 10. Now here it says if y is greater than height, well, if this isn't true, it doesn't execute this block of code. Here, it's not executed until y is greater than height. That is, y is greater than height when y runs off the bottom. Okay, remember, increasing y is going down. When y runs off the bottom, y is greater than height. It resets y to be zero. So the next time through the void draw, it draws the line again but it's drawing the lines all in the same place. Now, let's, uh, but we can't see that because it's drawing lines on top of other lines. Now, what, how might, well, how might I change things? Let me try something. Let me set background inside void draw. So every time through void draw, it resets the background to white. So I'll do that right here. So I'll just copy this. And then right here, I set the background to be white. So every time through void draw, the background so is set to be white. Now I run. Notice there, we only see the lines one at a time as it goes through void draw. Then it comes back and draws the lines again. Yeah, it refreshes itself. Yes. It's because 
here we're resetting the entire background to white right there. If I take this out and run, it runs as it did before. And then it'll redraw the lines, but you won't be able to tell. OK. There's that block of code. Now, X9, I want to get this finished today, so I might run over my typical time here. Simple loop with interactivity. OK, what is this doing? Let's run it first. There you go. I have a loop, but obviously something is going to depend on mouse X in there. So let's look at it. Void setup, void draw, set the background to be black inside void draw. Background zero. Start with I is zero, integer I is zero. While I is less than width of the window, we execute a block of code here. OK. <clears throat> no stroke. The distance between the current rectangle and the mouse is equal to the absolute value of the difference between I and mouse X. OK, so we're looking at the position of the mouse and the value of I the absolute value of that difference. Float distance. We're defining the variable distance to be a float and setting it equal to the absolute value between mouse X and I. So we're looking at this difference, and, and if it's negative, we're taking the turning it to positive. If it's positive, we leave it positive. The distance is used to fill the color of a rectangle at the horizontal location I. Fill, so we're filling depending on distance, what distance is, okay, which is the absolute, which is the absolute value of this and this. Then I draw a rectangle, and then I increase i, i plus equal 10. Let's run it again now. Okay, so the window starts off as black. So you see it starts off black on the left, and then as we go through, we keep drawing these rectangles. You can see the, sort of the vertical rectangles. And the rectangles get lighter and lighter as more of them are drawn. The black stays at the position of the mouse. So this is a, a little bit of a complicated thing. You might want you know, this, you know, go through this on your own time to see what's going on. We could, let's just experiment, do a simple experiment. Let me make a uh, distance. Let me increase it. Let me add 20 to it. There. So now distance is equal to this absolute difference plus 20. Now I run. Okay, well. I'm not seeing anything there. It's a look looks like it might be a little bit off. See the let's try this. Let's make it 100. That should be pretty clear, right? If it's doing something. And notice what's happening is the the gray level is changing here depending on distance. So that's what's changing here. So fill is because we have this fill distance right here. So here we're changing the gray level when we add, you know, 20 or 50 or 100 here. We're making it so it's not as black uh, and not as dark as it would be otherwise. OK. So let me, let me go on to the next one here.
old our friend Zug. Okay, so you see we go through this whole process of drawing Zug, which takes up you know, a fair amount of code to do that, right? Now I'll run. So there's Zug. And Zug goes and bounces. Uh, the thing here is Zug has uh, arms like a centipede has legs. And we define that in the for loop. There's a for loop here that draws a whole bunch of lines. So notice, let's look at the for loop. Integer i, here, come back up here. Notice that all these are set to be integers up here. A for loop, integer high, i equal to y plus 5. So we're going from i less than y plus h. OK, so as long as i is less than y plus h, this for loop is executed. And then each time through, it increments by 10 here. So the, the loop variable is i, starts at y plus 5. As long as i is less than y plus h, it increments, sets the stroke to black, and then it draws this line. Line is x minus w divided by 3. So this is the x position, the y position of one endpoint of the line. <clears throat> Here's the x position and y position of the other point of the line. Because the y positions are the same, it's drawing a horizontal line. <clears throat> Okay, <clears throat> so and then we draw Zug's body here. So, so we're using a for, a for loop to give Zug arms like a spider. Let me close that. And then many Zugs. <clears throat> OK. We set some variables here as integers, set up void draw. Here we have a for loop. Now, <clears throat> where is x defined? Let's look at this. x is not defined up here. It's not defined in here. We're in void draw. There's no x yet, <clears throat> although we do define y inside void draw. Now we don't define X until we get inside the loop. So X is only defined for this block of code between here and here, which is drawing the void, the for loop, which is drawing Zugs. So let's run this. So we're drawing many Zugs. We draw a Zug for each time through the for loop. <laughs> So I could change this. Here it says x less than width. I can make this a width divided by 2. And then run it. And I only have half as many zoogs because I'm stopping the for loop sooner. If I cha change it to 4, let's see what happens. So it's only getting to one zoog. So Here it's doing all, it's drawing a loop for all values of x less than width. And um, OK, so we're getting to the point here with some of these codes, and you're really going to have to go in and experiment with them a little bit to try to figure it out. And um, I, um, my frequently what happens with me, uh, especially I jump in and I'm using a programming language that's new to me. And, um, you know, and 
uh, almost every programming language is new anymore because as the languages evolve, I mean, I, I don't do enough programming to keep up with everything as it changes. Probably the programming language that I am most familiar with would be MATLAB. And let me uh, let me just start that for you. MATLAB. Now, MATLAB is not an open source processing language. There's nobody who is. Uh, there's no group of people in charge of MATLAB other than MathWorks, the company. There's a company that has produced MATLAB and all the variations on MATLAB. And uh, I think of MATLAB as being, um, it's designed quite specifically for doing mathematics and engineering. It's not really designed for business applications or doing a lot of text manipulation. And um, so in MATLAB is kind of like a, um, a modern advanced version of Fortran. And you, you may have heard of Fortran, maybe not. Fortran was the second language that I learned. It's what I did all of my programming for my PhD dissertation. Now you see, MATLAB is really different than processing and, and, and different than um, um, Java and C, but you see MATLAB has four loops. Here's a for loop. Four, here are the variables. Run goes from one to uppercase. Uppercase is a uppercase is a different variable name than lowercase. So, and this is uh, true in processing, where we use different case cases on the letters when we define things and define variables. They mean different things. So, run here is defined to be ten, for example. So here's a MATLAB code that I wrote last year. About a year ago, I think I was I was there at UCA when I was writing this code and I was uh, working with uh, uh, some of the computer science students and with Professor Fayez and trying to uh, work with them on writing a paper to get submitted to a journal. And the reason why I wanted to do that primarily was. To uh, the students could write a paper and get it published in a journal. If they were interested in going to graduate school, it would really, really help them. And that um, I wrote a paper when I was an undergraduate and it wasn't really something that I planned to do. I was working on a lab project in my junior year and uh, the lab project kind of took off and and we did a lot of things that we weren't originally assigned to do. We just kept carrying this project forward and we did so much new stuff that the professor suggested that we give this paper at a conference, which we did. But I, I can remember how devastatingly scared I was getting up in front of this room filled with faculty members, professors, and giving this paper at a conference. And um, I, um, I am convinced that it's, it's that one exercise of giving that paper that helped me get into graduate school at Princeton. As my, my grades weren't super great, uh, but there, there were two things I think that helped me and neither one of them was really planned through my career. I mean, they just happened and I did this really interesting project when I was a junior, end up giving a paper on it. And when they were looking for things that made me stand out when I was applying to graduate school, that paper was a big thing. And so what I was trying to do here with this 
is that there there was something a um, couple things I'm actually famous for. I don't know if I've talked about these things. I have no intention of bragging, but one of them was had to do with something called the Gershberg Saxton algorithm. And there's still open problems on the Gershberg Saxon algorithm. Now the Gershberg Saxon algorithm is called the Gershberg Saxon algorithm, but I invented it. And uh, it's, there's a story why it's called Gershberg Saxon. I didn't invent it for, first, there were three of us who invented it. So with, about within a year of one another, none of us knew about what the other per people were doing. And uh, so the person whose name ended up um, getting attached to it, or the two people, were the two people who wrote one of the papers, Gershberg and Saxton. So it's called Gershberg Saxton algorithm, even though I also invented it. I mean, that's sort of that's the way life works. Most people whose names are associated with things aren't the first people who did it anyway. Anyway, so there's this. And uh, there's still open questions on Gershberg Saxton. And so I r decided to investigate one of these things. And I uh, wrote this paper. And uh, I mean, I wrote this code to investigate it. And uh, then I worked with the students on how the code worked and worked with them on. Uh, So here I'm running the MATLAB program and you see we ge generate these graphs to investigate properties of things here. So this is what this paper was all about. And MATLAB, like I said, is probably the language that I know best of all. Doing a bunch of graphs there. Although I'm trying to become better right now at Python because Python has the ability to do text file manipulation, uh, pretty much as good as any computer language anywhere, which makes Python really good for studying DNA sequences because the DNA sequences just have those four letters in, uh, of the, the the elements in the DNA. I forget what the four letters are, so because I'm not a biologist, but uh, my daughter Mara is studying genetics and I've been telling her she needs to learn uh, computer programming because genetics has largely become um, a, an area of studying large data. You know, you look at two genomes and trying to decide what the similarities and differences between those genomes are, and they all have to do with the sequences and orders of these four letters. So studying and analyzing genomes is all about doing string manipulation in programs. So you're trying to see if somebody and two people or two animals or whatever have similar strings of genes. You have to look at these character codes or these strings in a program. And Python is very good at that. And there are so there are a lot of people now who are doing genetic programming using Python. There are also some other languages that they're using, but Python is actually one of the bigger ones. So even though her university program uh, in genetics really hasn't caught, caught up to this because they're not expecting most of the students as undergraduates in biology, even the ones studying genetics, they're not making them learn programming even if you get into graduate school and continue studying genetics, you will have to learn programming. So I've been trying to get up to speed on Python so that 
it, whenever she catches a break, and she's marking her tail off right now in her courses, but maybe a little bit in the summer, or whatever, maybe she'll have a little bit more time. And I was hoping to work with her in Python, but I'm not an expert in Python. And, um, and so um, I'm trying to learn that a little bit so I can learn how to do string manipulations in Python and then go with her with Python in the same way that I'm going with you in processing. So what am I doing in processing? I'm basically going through the or book a chapter at a time and looking at each section in each lesson and you know writing example codes is what I'm doing. So if you want to learn processing more or you want to learn another computer language, my suggestion, if you're not going to take a course in it, my suggestion is you grab a really good book and you go through that book a section at a time. OK, because hopefully if the book is well written, you know, you have each section builds on the previous sections and you can learn the code that way. And if you have questions that aren't answered in the book, then frequently, you know, the authors who write the book don't answer every question, then you can go on with Google or YouTube or whatever and ask the questions and see how things work. So as you see, as we're going through the code now and things are getting slightly more complicated, here, let me get out of the, uh, I think I've done this, all of our lessons for today here. Yep. Don't save here. There is a website, I think it's called Stack Overflow something. Yeah, like sometimes when we Google about processing, when I Google about processing, what a certain function does, uh, this website pops up and people, they have discussions there and they explain to each other what yeah. the function block of yeah. means, etc. Yes, uh, and processing is good that way with the users. You go in with other computer languages, such as uh, C, you know, C, which is now sort of a standard if you're a computer scientist, ultimately it seems like everything is done in C in some way or another. You go in to a C user group and you ask a question, and you may have had this experience with user group websites. You ask a question, and the first five responses will tell you what an idiot you are for asking that question. Either that's not an appropriate question for the group, or how could you possibly be so stupid as to ask that question, or whatever. And um, so, you know, you you get past the first few responses, and if you're lucky, there'll be a few people who will actually answer your question and be try to be helpful. So, um, you know, the internet user groups are not always the place to go. Um, if you're looking for friendly support, you know, people are just assholes. And uh, but that, that's the way they are in life, too. So. So, OK, so I've gone way over today. Typically what I go over, like I said in the beginning, which you may not have heard, I have posted the um, sample exam on Moodle. Um, and you can look at it up until the end of next week. Um, at, at the week after that, I will put, put up the real exam, and you'll have that week to work on the exam, the real exam. So you can do the real exam, send me your answers, your solutions, and, and I hope to make it very, very similar to the sample exam, very similar. And so you'd go through the sample exam. It should be minimal effort to do the real exam. You go through, do the real exam, send me the results, and hopefully everybody gets an A or a B in the course. And um, 
the um, because uh, because you've been working so hard, everybody gets an A or B in the course, and you will have exam week to focus on doing your other uh, exams. And uh, so that was uh, what I, that's what I'm trying to do is is not bog down your exam week by doing an exam in computer science. So um, I uh, uh, I think I'm done for today. A anybody have any questions? Okay. I don't think so. Thank nope. you, sir. It was yeah. very informative and happy Thanksgiving. Hey, yeah, thank you. And you have a happy Thanksgiving too for what's left of it there. Okay. Um, nice talking with you. Yeah. And uh, stop recording.